where you can find them. But now we're going to go a little bit more in depth. I don't believe we're going to finish the collection today. But that is not my goal. There's, there's way too many slides here for an hour and 15 minutes. Next week's lecture is on the integumentary system. That one is fairly short. I think it's only 40 slides or so. And we have a full class period. And so what, we, what we'll do next week, we'll finish this one, then do next week's lecture. Okay? And if somehow we run over, the next one is a skeletal lecture, and that one's also fairly short. And so our goal is in two and a half lecture periods, this being the half, we'll get through three lectures. So our tissue lecture is primarily going to be based on different types of cells. Because uh, remember on our levels of organization, just above cells is tissue, right? A tissue is multiple cells working together for a specific purpose. And so when you talk about tissue, you're really talking about different types of cells working together. In, in our body, we have about 50 trillion cells, and those cells are made up of about 200 different types. We break the tissues down into four main parts that we saw in the lab. There's epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscular tissue. And remember that an organ is a structure that has multiple types of tissues. It can be 50, but it, but it can be 10, but it has to be at least two. If there's only one, that is not an organ. Our lab was called the histology lab. Histology is the study of tissue, and then how those tissues come together to make it work. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is epithelial tissue. And this one's probably the, the broadest category. So epithelia are sheets of cells that are adhered to each other, and then we also see that they're going to be adhered to what's called the basement membrane below them. And these sheets are going to be at least one cell thick. We saw the simple epithelia that are one layer thick, and then there's the stratified epithelia, which are at least two layers thick. Epithelial tissue is going to cover our body surface. We, when we saw the integumentary system, we saw that the skin is mostly epithelial tissue. But it's also going to line our body cavities. Basically, the surfaces of our body are going to be epithelial tissue, whether those are external surfaces or internal surfaces. The upper surface is usually exposed to that space. And when we talk about this, we have an upper and a lower side of this epithelial tissue. The basement membrane is going to be the lower part. Also, most of the glands in our body are either buried in epithelial tissue, made up of epithelial cells, or they are epithelial tissue as themselves. Most epithelial tissue does not have blood vessels. So most of the tissue is going to have connective tissue below it that has blood vessels in it. And so the nutrients are going to come out of the blood vessels in that connective tissue and then migrate or diffuse up into the epithelial tissue. Picture our skin, that model. Remember we had all the layers of epithelial tissue and then there was the connective tissue at the bottom with all the blood vessels. There were no blood vessels up in the epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue has a bunch of different functions. Most of them are fairly straightforward and more or less obvious, but they're, they protect a lot of things. They protect everything in our body because epithelial tissue is the skin on the outside, right? Also, they are going to line the inside of our body, so they're going to protect the insides also. Because epithelial tissue makes glands, epithelial tissue makes chemical secretion. They also excrete waste, so we'll talk about the difference between secretion and excretion, but basically secretion 
is putting out things that you want to have in the body, and excretion is putting out things that you want to get rid of from the body. Epithelial tissue also is going to absorb things. So the lining of our intestines are going to be epithelial tissue, and so that's going to absorb nutrients. They can also selectively filter substances. And so they can allow things to get through. They can al allow some things to get through, but then block other things that they want to keep out. And then there's also going to be parts of the epithelial tissue that are designed to sense stimuli, whether that be uh, maybe microvilli or cilia on the outside of the cell that are going to detect something touching it, or whether it's, it's temperature or anything like that, it's going to sense some things. When we look at the cells, microscopically, they're going to be very close together. We're going to be creating more or less a solid sheet. There's going to be little or no space between them. And they're going to be dividing at a fairly high rate. Think about that. Most of them are touching the outside of our body or, or areas, uh, cavities inside of our body, and they're sort of, sort of serving a protective role. They're sacrificing themselves in order to protect the rest of our body. And so they're constantly dying, and so they have to be constantly replaced. And so if you look at them under the microscope, you're going to be seeing a lot of the cells dividing. Whereas if you look at something like a, a, a liver tissue, maybe you're not going to see as high a rate of division. So this is that basement membrane that I mentioned. So imagine we have our epithelial cells up here, whether it be one layer or two layers or five layers or however many you have. And then down here is the connective tissue. Right in between the two is going to be a very, very thin membrane called the basement membrane. On a microscope slide, you will probably never even see it. On a diagram, it's probably just going to be a line that's a different color. Okay? It's going to be very, very thin. It's made of complexes of protein and carbohydrate. And what it essentially does is it's the glue that holds the epithelial tissue to the connective tissue. Neither one of those things is all that sticky, and so the basement membrane is going to hold the two together. It's like double-sided tape that holds the two, two tissues together. So the basal surface is going to be the surface of the epithelial layer that is touching the basement membrane. Okay, Basal, B-A-S, basement, B-A-S. The basal surface is the bottom surface, and then the apical surface is the top. I don't have a good way of remembering apical is the top, maybe apex, but to me, basal basement is very easy. And so if you remember that the other side is apical, then you've got it down. So remember we had the simple and the stratified epithelia, with the simple having just one layer, and so every cell is going to touch the basement membrane. If we have multiple layers, that's the stratified. And then sort of in between, we have pseudostratified. And so on the surface, with a quick, quick glance, this looks like it's stratified. But if you look more, in, more closely, they all touch the basement membrane. And so that actually is a simple a simple epithelial tissue, but because it looks like it's stratified, we call it pseudo-stratified and give it its own term. In terms of the shape of the cells themselves, remember the squamous, which is flat, cuboidal, which is cube-shaped or round-shaped or hexagon or whatever. It's basically the same dimensions all the way around. And then there was the columnar cells, which are tall and skinny. Remember, we had these, go these goblet cells. You saw those in the lab. They're kind of shaped like wine glasses with a big bulb that contains mucus and then a thin little stem that touches the apical surface of the membrane or, or the epithelial tissue. And so when that goblet cell kind of contracts, 
or it opens up that stem, it's going to release that mucus out into the, the surroundings. So these are the slides we went through. So I'm not going to spend much time on them. But this is a simple squamous epithelium. It's one layer thick, and they are more or less flat. It's the simple cuboidal, and so it's one layer thick, but they are more or less round or cuboidal. The simple columnar, and so they all are going to touch the basement membrane down here, but they're tall and skinny. This is pseudostratified, and so it's showing the basement membrane is down at the bottom here. And so at quick glance, it looks like you have kind of two layers, one here and one here. But if you actually look at it, it's much easier to see in the drawing than the actual slide. But if you follow each one down, it is actually going to touch the basement membrane. And so it would be very hard to give you this on an exam as a picture and say, is that stratified or pseudo-stratified? If, if you had a drawing, then if, you went, if I went through and made sure that yes, in fact, you can see that everyone touches the basement membrane, then that would be fair. But in a picture like that, it's near impossible because some of them, I mean, I, I can see some that don't touch the bottom. And it's because you had to cut it. And so they don't necessarily go straight up and down. They might kind of curve a little bit. And so you might have cut off the part at the bottom where it, where it actually touched. The stratified epithelia, we can have a lot of different layers, number of layers, but we have to have at least two. And it's just going to be a layer of cell on top of another layer of cells on top of another layer of cells. And only the bottom layer is going to touch that basement membrane. You can have the squamous, the cuboidal, or the columnar that form the stratified epithelia, although the squamous and the cuboidal are much more common than a columnar uh, stratified epithelium. There is a fourth type that we did not talk about in lab, I don't think, that we'll see here, and that's called a transitional epithelium. So the stratified squamous is the most common epithelial tissue in our body. Where is that, do you think? I think I heard it. On the outside. So it is our skin, right? Picture when we talked about this integumentary system in lab. That was a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. It's stratified, there's a whole bunch of layers but the ones at the top were very flat and thin. So our skin is a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And remember that only the bottom layers are going to undergo mitosis. The ones at the bottom are dividing, making new cells that push up. And so the ones at the very top of this are going to either be alive but not dividing, or in the case of our skin, the ones on top will have actually already died. There's layer upon layer of dead skin cells on the top of our skin. Also remember that the stratified squamous can come in keratinized or non-keratinized form. And so generally the, the stratified squamous epithelia that face the outside, our skin, are going to be keratinized. The things that face the inside of our body, like the inside of our mouths, are going to be non-keratinized. That way it's a little bit softer in our mouth and a little bit more flexible. So this was our keratinized stratified squamous. And so there's a whole bunch of dead cells here. I mean, hope, I'm hoping you can really see the difference between the live cells, where you can very easily pick out a nucleus in these dead cells, where unless someone told you they were cells, you wouldn't look at that and say those are cells, right? This just kind of wavy mess. Those are, in fact, dead cells, though. And then on the outside is the keratin layer. For the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, it looks essentially the same as this, but it's missing these two layers. It's missing the dead cells, and it's missing the keratin. 
And so this is going to be fairly tough because it has so many layers of cells, but it doesn't have that hard keratin on the outside. This was our stratified cuboidal that we saw. And so in this case, our basement membrane is actually going to be on the outside here. And the apical surface is going to be on the inside. But we have two layers. There's a layer of cells out here and a layer of cells in here. And they're more or less round. Again, it's easier to see in the drawing. But they're more or less cuboidal or round. And it's multiple layers, so it's stratified cuboidal. This is that transitional epithelium that we did not see in the lab. And so because it is considered stratified, there are multiple layers, but it's kind of stretchy. And so when you first look at it, it's going to look more or less cuboidal, but they're designed to stretch. And so imagine if you take that and you stretch it. If you take a cell, it's kind of round, and you stretch it, what shape is it going to become? Long. It's going to become long and flat, right? And so it's, this is called transition. Because in some cases, you may look at it, and it looks like that. In other cases, you may look at it, and it looks flat. This is goes in places that are designed to stretch, like your bladder. Your bladder needs to be able to expand and contract very easily. And so if you have an empty bladder, tissue may look like this. If you just drink a big gulp, you may have a big bladder, and the cells may be stretched really thin. Okay. That's the epithelial tissue. Next was the connective tissue. This was a tissue that more or less acts as a, a scaffold. We saw a lot of collagen fibers and elastic fibers and things like that. They're going to be stretchy, and most of the tissue is actually going to be made up of things other than cells. So in the epithelial tissue, it was cell next to cell next to cell next to cell. And there really wasn't much there other than the cells. But the connective tissue is going to have a matrix or an extracellular matrix around them. They're going to put things out around them that they're going to live in. And so the cells generally are not actually even going to be touching each other. There's going to be a cell over here, and a cell over here, and another one over here, and a bunch of fibers in between them. These are going to provide support and kind of glue to hold our body together. And the amount of blood vessels present in these connective tissues is really going to vary. Think about the areolar tissue that we saw under our skin. There were a lot of blood vessels in there because they had to supply all of the epithelial tissue above them. But what we're going to see is that cartilage is also considered a connective tissue. And a lot of the cartilage in our body has no blood vessels at all. Think about the cartilage in the tip of your nose. There's no blood vessels actually in that cartilage. So we said that connective tissue is going to kind of bind things together, act as, as glue to hold things together. It's also going to act as glue to hold different things together that need to function as one. And so tendons and ligaments are made up of connective tissue. Bones and cartilage are both considered connective tissue, so they're going to support all of the soft tissues in our body. They're going to provide protection, like our ribs. Our blood is also considered connective tissue. Our bone marrow makes blood cells, and so the connective tissue is going to include the majority of our immune system. We need connective tissue, the bones, to move. If I tried to move my arm, the muscles may, may contract, but if I have no bone in my arm, my arm is not going to go up. We saw the adipose tissue. This is for storage of fat. Our bones store calcium and phosphorus. It's not such a big deal in adults, but in at least small children, they have that brown fat which burns a lot of calories, and that's going to make a lot of body heat. They don't have the muscle mass to keep themselves warm, 
And so they have this brown fat that's going to help keep them warm. And then so there's also transport. Blood is designed to transport things, and so our connective tissue is going to transport. Okay, so now we're going to start talking more about the different types. We already saw a number of them in lab, but there are actually quite a few more that we didn't talk about. So there are going to be some connective tissues that are considered fibrous and some that are not. And so if we imagine a fibrous connective tissue, just go buried in that, there are going to be a number of different types of cells. And so one of them is going to be fibroblasts. So a fibroblast are something we saw in lab. And that's something they asked you to look at this microscope slide and label the fibroblasts. And what I told you, I believe, is just look in there and pick out the nuclei. Most of the, most of the cells that you pick out of something like areolar connective tissue is going to be fibroblasts. They're just going to kind of roam around. And what their role is, is they are going to make the fibers. They're going to make the collagen fibers. They're going to make the elastic fibers. And then they're also going to make what's called the ground substance, which we'll talk see about see in a few slides. But the ground substance is essentially what's going to fill all of the empty space between the cells and the fibers. When we looked at it on the scope, it looked like it was just empty space. But it's not. There's usually going to be some sort of a liquid there, kind of a jelly substance. And that's going to be our ground substance. We have macrophages that are going to be found in this connective tissue. They're part of the immune system. They're sort of the, the security guards whose job is to look out for invaders, be the first line of defense, and then call the big guns. Okay? So they're going to eat eat any sort of invader that's phagus cytosis that they find, but they're also going to alert the immune system that the invader exists. Don't, don't worry too much about that bullet point. Also found in the connective tissue are going to be leukocytes. These are also part of the immune system, but these are specialized white blood cells. And so the macrophages are going to set the alarm, then the leukocytes are going to come along and try to clean everything up. There are a couple of different types of leukocytes, but I'm not too concerned about you knowing the difference here. I want, to, I want you to know the difference between macrophages and leukocytes, but not these smaller bullet points. And then there are plasma cells, which make antibodies, which are also part of the immune system. And there are mast cells, which are going to secrete a couple of different things. They can secrete heparin, which is going to prevent your blood from clotting. And it's also going to secrete histamine that's going to make your blood vessels dilate or grow bigger. These are all different cells that you can find in your fibrous connective tissue. And so what can you tell me which one of these kind of is very, very different than the rest, or would be found in a different place in the body. So fibroblasts? Fibroblasts. What connects the rest of them together? Blood. Blood. And so if you're looking under the microscope and you see something that looks like areolar connective tissue or dense regular connective tissue, that's not blood. And so you're not going to see these. And so if you see a cell, it's going to be a fibroblast. If you're looking at blood, it's going to be one of these. You're not really going to see fibroblasts in blood. Why would you not see fibroblasts in blood? Right. Blood is not going to make collagen fibers. It's not going to make elastic fibers. If you did, you just have this mesh in your bloodstream that would prevent anything from getting through. And so these are going to be more sticky, stiff connective tissues, and these are going to be in the blood. Oops, one more. The adipocytes that you know, are, those are the, the fat storage molecules. So those are the cells found in the fibrous connective tissue. There are also different fibers. We saw a couple of them. We saw the collagen fibers. 
collagen actually makes up 25% of all of the proteins in our body. It's tough, it's flexible, it's stretchy. When you stretch it, it comes back. So it's, re it's repeatable in its stretchiness. This is going to be used to make things that need to be stretchy, like tendons and ligaments in the base of our skin. If you look at things like cartilage and bone, you're not going to see it as much. And so in a lot of other fiber and other tissues, you're going to have these big, huge collagen fibers. And things like cartilage, they're going to be much smaller. And so they're not going to be as big or stiff. The one we didn't talk about, I don't think, are reticular fibers. These are collagen fibers, but they're very thin, they're very small, and they're coated with glycoprotein, which remember is a protein with some carbohydrates stuck on it. These are, are only found in a few places in our body, mainly the spleen and lymph nodes. So reticular fibers are kind of a subset of the collagen fibers. Then there were the elastic fibers. These are small, and they're kind of branchy. So when you saw the slide of the areolar tissue in lab, there were two sizes of fibers. The big ones, they were really big, were collagen fibers. And then the really thin ones were the elastic fibers. I don't believe you saw these in lab. The elastic fibers are made up of elastin. So now I'll talk about that ground substance. Remember the ground substance I said was going to fill all of the empty space in the connective tissue. It's usually going to be like jelly. It's going to be thick. It's, it's, it's going to provide a little bit of support for the things around it. Those fibers, yes, they're stiff, but if there's nothing holding them up, they're going to fall over. Think of seaweed in the ocean. It's stiff enough to stand up in the ocean, but if you dry it out, it just falls over. These are primarily going to be made up and contain glycosa aminoglycans, or GAGs. These are really long polysaccharides that are going to be made up of amino sugars, which are sugars with nitrogen added in. And most sugars don't have nitrogen. And then also uronic acid, which is a disaccharide. The purpose of this is to control the water and electrolytes around the cells of the tissue. In order for those cells to survive and do what they need to do, they need to have the right amount of water and the right amount of things like sodium and potassium. So the GAGs are going to control that. The most common one in our body is chondroitin sulfate. Has anybody ever taken chondroitin sulfate before? I don't think anybody here is old enough. But people who have arthritis, a lot of times will take chondroitin sulfate because it, they think it will help their joints. As far as I know, there have been no clinical trials on it. On the surface, scientifically, it makes no sense whatsoever because if you eat it, your body is just going to break it down. And so it's not going to be chondroitin sulfate by the time it gets in your bloodstream. But my parents had an older dog that had arthritis, and they gave them chondroitin sulfate supplements, and the dog got, got better. So you cannot tell me that was a placebo effect, because the dog just thought it was eating cheese, and there was chondroitin sulfate buried in it. Okay? So I don't have the answer. On the surface, it wouldn't seem like it would work, but maybe it does. And so the chondroitin sulfate is going to be what gives cartilage its stiffness. There are also a couple others that I'm not too concerned about either. Also in this ground substance are going to be proteoglycans. So we had the, before we had the proteins with the, with the carbohydrates on them. This is again, remember, a mixture of protein and carbohydrate, but this is more carbohydrate. It's a lot of carbohydrate with a little bit of protein stuck on it. These are going to make a colloid. Remember, a colloid, we said, was like a suspension, 
you can kind of see, it's kind of hazy looking, but it won't settle. There are very small particles that kind of sit around in, in the solvent. And then there are adhesive glycoproteins that are going to kind of hold everything together. So these are going to kind of create an environment, but these adhesive glycoproteins are really going to be the glue that holds everything together and keeps it from falling apart. Okay, so we talked about in the lab, there was loose connective tissue and there was dense. And so the loose connective tissue is going to be our areolar. So this is the only loose tissue that we saw in lab. And then there is the reticulum. So reticular is another type of loose tissue. And when we see a picture of it, it's going to be obvious why. Then there was the dense. So there was the dense regular. And then there was the dense irregular. More or less looked the same, but the dense regular was very neatly packed together. And the dense irregular was more randomly spread apart. So this was the areola that we talked about. So just remember to keep that picture in your mind, right? There's the fibroblasts, and then there's the big collagen fibers, and then there are the little elastic fibers. So the collagen fibers are here, kind of a little bit lighter in color, and then the smaller, thinner elastic fibers. This is the reticular tissue. So this is not a slide we've seen yet, but as soon as you look at that, you should be able to realize why it's a loose connective tissue, right? There's a lot of white here. And so what you're looking at is all of these kind of squiggly lines that kind of look like worms thrown on a, on a plate. Those are the reticular fibers. They're not long and stiff. They're just kind of wavy and laying around. And then this is kind of pointed out a couple of immune cells in here. And so this is going to be a mesh of reticular fiber and fibroblasts. And so these fibers do not look like that, right? There's a big difference between looking at that and not just the color, but the shape between that and that. So you should be able to determine, if you look at tissue, I would say, well, they both have a lot of space, right? And so they're both loose. And then I would look at, well, what do the fibers look like? If they're long and straight, it's going to be areolar. If it looks like this mess, that's going to be the reticulum. These aren't found in a whole lot of places, but include the, the spleen and the lymph node. This was our dense regular, so not nearly as much empty space, so it's dense, and it's very neatly packed, right? So this was our dense regular, and then our dense irregular. Again, very compact, but it's just random waves. So this is the dense irregular. Adipose tissue, we saw in the lab, we didn't talk about it too much, but this is going to be what's where our fat is stored. This is where our energy is going to be stored primarily. This is long-term storage. The uh, glycogen in our liver is short-term storage. The fat in our adipose tissue is going to be long-term storage. And the fat is constantly going in and out. Okay? It's not like a, a bank account where you put money in and you come back 20 years later when you need it. It's going to be like your main bank account, where every time you get paid, money goes in, and every time you need money, money comes out. It's constantly going in and out. Even though we look at our, our adipose tissue, and it looks like it's the same size, the same amount of fat in there, it must not have gone anywhere. It's constantly going in and out. said there are two types, the white and brown. White is what we have, some of us unfortunately more than others. But if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see when you see the picture, it'll ring a bell. It kind of looks like chicken wire. 
And not only is it going to be used for energy uh, storage, it's also going to provide insulation and also cushion. And so uh, some of our organs have a lot of fat stuck to them. In one of our labs, you will do a eyeball dissection. And so I'm, I'm guessing on those eyeballs, there will be fat on them. Your kidneys also have quite a bit of fat on them. This is that brown fat. It's only in fetuses in young children. It has a lot of mitochondria in it. Mitochondria in blood vessels are kind of brownish in color. So it gives the fat a little bit more color. And it's pretty much sole purpose is to generate heat. And so one kind of interesting area of research is people is, are looking at how can you turn this into this in an adult? Because if you can take the white fat and turn it into brown fat, it's going to burn calories doing absolutely nothing, right? So that may hopefully, hopefully let, let some of us live a little bit longer. So this is that chicken wire I was talking about, right? It looks like a bunch of empty space, but it's not. That's, that's going to be where the fat is stored. Okay, now we're kind of going to get into the connective tissues we didn't really talk about. First one is cartilage. So this is going to be a connect, a stiff connective tissue. And so if you look at the fibers in there, it's going to be stiff, but the matrix around the cells is going to be kind of flexible. And so it's stiff, yet flexible. So if you think about the difference between cartilage in the tip of my nose and the bone up at the base of my nose, what's the main difference in function in func or how it moves and how it what you can do to it? I can do this, right? It's flexible here. It's not flexible up here. But if I don't touch it, my nose isn't flopping around, right? It's stiff, but it's flexible. It's going to give shape to a lot of things that need to be able to change shape under pressure, like your ear, your nose, and your larynx. So in that cartilage, there are going to be a couple types of cells. Chondroblasts are going to make the fibers of the cartilage. So the cells that are going to make the fibers that make up cartilage are going to be called chondroblasts. So they're going to sit there, and they're going to put out these fibers. After a while, they're going to get trapped. They're going to be stuck in their little empty pocket, surrounded by all of the collagen that they just made. At that point, they're called chondrocytes. And they're trapped in these lacuna. The lacuna are the little cavities, or little pockets, that they saved themselves space for. Okay. So imagine a cell, I'm trapped, I'm in my lacuna, but there's all this cartilage around me that I made. Most cartilage on the outside of it is going to have something called a perichondrium. This is going to be some dense, irregular connective tissue that's going to be around most cartilage. And the purpose of this is it's going to contain some of these chondroblasts. Because once a chondroblast is completely trapped, it can't make any more cartilage. It doesn't have the strength to make more and push the old stuff out. And so it, if you want to continue making more cartilage, you have to build it from the outside, not from the inside out. So this is going to have some of these chondroblasts that it can put onto the outside layer of the cartilage so that you can make more cartilage. And so this is going to be found in almost all cartilage, except articular cart cartilage. And articular cartilage is the cartilage that fits right in our joint. So imagine my elbow, where the two bones come together, there's cartilage there. Why would I not want perichondrium in my elbow? Said so the purpose of the perichondrium is to allow the, the, connect, the 
the cartilage to continue growing. And your joints will keep growing. Right. And so my, my bones stop growing, but the cartilage in my elbow keeps growing, that's not going to work very well, right? I'm going to end up with an elbow like this, and it's not going to be able to, to move. If my nose keeps growing, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, we actually know that. Think about old people. They got big noses and big ears, right? They keep growing a little bit as when they get old. It not, doesn't grow as fast as when you're a little kid, but they do continue to grow a little bit. So that's not a big deal. Cartilage has no blood vessels, none. And so kind of like the epithelial tissue on our skin, it's all going to have to come from the connective tissue around it. So everything is going to have to diffuse in. Because of that, cartilage is going to heal very slowly. You need oxygen and nutrients for the cells to divide and do what they need to do to heal cartilage. Our bones are actually quite well vascularized. There are blood vessels in our bones. So if you break a bone, a bone can heal fairly quickly. Cartilage, though, can't. So the matrix of the cartilage has a lot of those glycosaminoglycans, and then there's also collagen. There are a couple different types of, or not a couple, three types of cartilage, and what's going to determine the difference between them is going to be the fibers that are present in them, or how much of the two different types that we have. So we'll talk about each individually, but there's high, going to be hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic. So this is the hyaline cartilage. If you just look at this, it's going to be clear and going to have some, kind of be glassy. Okay? The collagen here is very fine. They're going to be very small strands. Collagen is not clear. And so if you have very fine strands of collagen, the cartilage itself is going to be clear. This is going to be the type of cartilage that's going to be found in our joints. It's also going to be found in our trachea. It's going to hold our trachea open. It's going to hold our vocal cords. And it's also going to be involved in the growth of our bones when we're young. Next is the elastic cartilage. This has a lot of the elastic fibers. Not as much cartilage, a lot of the elastic fibers. And this is going to have that perichondrium. And so this is going to be places that you have to have support, but it needs to be very flexible. Like my ear, right? I can do this with my ear. My nose will wiggle, but it won't fold. My ear will fold. Then there's fibrocartilage. So this is going to have a lot of collagen. So this is going to be very strong stuff. Where you're going to find this is between the vertebrae and your spine. So that needs to, one, it needs to be very flexible so that when you take a pounding, it's going to bounce back. But it also needs to be very strong because as I'm standing here, as you're sitting there, all of that weight, all of that gravity is pulling down on this. So if you have something that's soft, it's just going to crush. So it needs to be strong to keep it separated, but it also really needs to be stretchy so that it can kind of absorb some shock. That takes us to bone. The bone is also called osseous tissue. It's going to be connective tissue that is calcified. And so there's going to be this hard calcium mineral involved in it. It's going to make it very hard. And so our bones are considered organs, and the bones as a whole are not just going to be made up of bone tissue. A bone is going to be made up of bone tissue, cartilage, the bone marrow, and pretty much any tissue type you can imagine. And so we'll talk more about bone in depth in our skeletal lecture, but there are two types 
of osseous tissue or bone tissue. There's spongy bone, which is going to be the inside of our bones. It's very porous looking. It looks like a sponge. And the kind of the little, we'll see a picture of it. I'll point out when we get there. But imagine the little waves on a sponge. Okay? You get the holes and then the little fibers that hold the holes together. Those kind of waves are going to be called trabeculi. If you have spongy bone, it's going to be covered by compact bone, which is the other type. You'll never have spongy bone off on its own. Spongy bone is always inside of compact bone. Where this, this is going to be primarily in the heads of our long bones. So our long bones are like your, your arm, the bones in your arm and your legs. You can all picture what a bone looks like, right? In the center, it's long and skinny, and then there's the big knobs on the ends. So in the, the knobs on the ends are going to be spongy bone. In some flat bones, like our, like our breastbone or our sternum, there's going to be some spongy bone in them also. The compact bone is what you think of when you think of bone that hard, white, mineral stuff. This is a very complex tissue that we're going to see. There's a lot that goes into it. It's going to be a combination of cells, matrix, open space, and blood vessels, and nerves, and all kinds of stuff. So this is compact bone. Okay. So what you're looking at here, so these black circles here, are open channels. So these are the central canals. And then, so traveling through those central canals are going to be blood vessels and nerves. From the center here, we're going to create the hard mineral tissue around it. So the hard tissue is going to be your bone matrix. And it's going to be made in layers. So you're going to have cells here putting out layers, cells over here that are putting out layers, and they'll grow and grow and grow until they meet. And so if you take the central canal and all of the layers, and so that whole unit is going to be called an osteon. So the osteon is the central canal and the layers around it. And the layers are called lamella. If you take if you take this and you let it mature, so this is a mature bone, then the cells that are within little pockets Lacuna are these little black spots here. Okay? And so in those little black spots are going to be cells that are putting out the, the hard bone. And so the cells that are within those pockets are called osteocytes. Between one osteon and another, or between one lacuna to another, are going to be canaliculi. This is going to allow the osteocytes, the cells, to contact each other and control what's going on. And so the canaliculi are these little fibers here. And so they're connecting that one to that one. So they're not circular. So if you look at this, you're going to see some lines that are circular, that are going around the central canal. And then there are some like here and here and here that are not. Those are going to be the canaliculi. Then we have the periosteum. This is going to be connective tissue. It's a very thin layer of connective tissue that's going to be on the outside of the whole thing. So on the outside of one of your bones is a very thin layer called the periosteum. So next we have the blood. So we said the blood is a connective tissue, but it's a fluid connective tissue. 
its primary purpose is to transport things, whether those things are cells or molecules or ions or waste or whatever they may be, the blood transports things. In the ground substance, the thing that fills all of the empty space in our blood is going to be the blood plasma. Floating in that plasma are things that are primarily made by cells or our cells themselves. And so we have erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. They're going to transport oxygen from our lungs to our muscles or to our cells. They're going to also transport the carbon dioxide from our cells to our lungs in order to get rid of it. We have leukocytes, which are the white blood cells, part of the immune system. Again, I'm not too concerned about these things down here. And then there are platelets, which are cells that are involved in the clotting of our blood. So that's all you need to know about the blood at this point. Then we have the nervous and the muscular tissue. Nervous and muscular tissue, we say, are excitable. In when we say that they're excitable, that means that if we give them a stimulus, we can make them react. When they react, they're going to change what we call the membrane potential. And the membrane potential is a voltage difference between the inside and the outside of that membrane. In nerve cells, think of our neuron from lab last week. If you get a voltage change, that's going to create a signal in that neuron, and it's going to pass that neuron onto another neuron. And it's going to go from one neuron to another, to another, to another. Eventually, it's going to reach either the spinal cord or the brain, which will interpret that signal. In a muscle cell, if we change that membrane potential, what's going to happen is the cell is going to contract it's going to shorten. And if a lot of cells do that at once, my whole arm will contract. So this was our neuron. We talked about what neurons, they detect the stimuli in the dendrites, and then it gets, goes through the cell body or the neurosoma, and then down the axon. And then there's also neuroglia. So the two cell types, of nervous tissue are the neurons in the neuroglia. We said the neuroglia are the, the main important cells. They're the ones who actually sense and transmit the signals. The neuroglia are support cells. They exist to help the neurons do what they need to do. Talked about the cell body, the dendrites, and the axons. We haven't really talked about muscle tissue at all. So muscle, muscular tissue are going to be made up of cells, and in general, those cells are going to be elongated. They're going to be kind of long and skinny. If they start out long and skinny, then that way they can contract. If you start out short and blobby, you can't contract very much. But if you're long and skinny, you can contract. Their job is to contract, and when they contract, they're going to pull on something. Muscles. Pull. That's the only thing they can do. They can't push, they can only pull. And when they pull, they're going to exert a force on whatever they're connected to. When they create that force, they're going to move things. So whether that's moving a limb, or moving my mouth, or moving my tongue, or moving the, the, the clamp on the bottom of your stomach, whatever you need to clamp off or move, that's going to be accomplished by muscle tissue. Our muscles also provide a lot of our body heat. So the vast majority of our body heat is going to come from our muscles and also that sodium potassium pump. We said, remember, that the majority of our calories are actually just burned by that pump and that creates a lot of heat. There are three types of skeletal muscle. We'll talk more in depth about this in our actual muscle lecture. But there's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And you immediately, when you think about muscle tissue, what you immediately think of is skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle is made up of very, very long cells. So if we look at these pictures, 
these are nuclei. This is actually one cell that's continuing off this way and off that way. These are very big cells. And a lot of these muscles are going to attach to bone, and each one has multiple nuclei. Skeletal muscle is one of the few parts of our body where the cells have more than one nucleus. Because they're so big, one nucleus can't manage the entire cell. It can't get the mRNA all the way down to the other end so you can make protein on one end. You need nuclei spread throughout and so that you can have mRNA spread throughout so you can be making protein throughout the cell. Under a microscope, they're going to contain these striations, or these little stripes, the dark and light bands. This is unique to skeletal muscle. You won't see this anywhere else. So if you look under the microscope and you see these bands, it's immediately skeletal muscle. Okay? And we'll talk more about where these bands come from in the muscle lecture, but there are different proteins in there. Some of them are going to be closely packed, and that's going to make the dark bands, and then you'll have loose areas where there isn't as much protein, and that will be the light colored area. We say that muscular tissue is voluntary, meaning that we can control when it contracts. I can look at my arm, and I can say, arm, contract, and it contracts. Okay? I can control when it does and does not contract. And so that is voluntary. Second type is cardiac muscle. And this is only present in your heart. It is nowhere else. The, the, muscle, the, the muscle cells here are called myocytes or cardiocytes. And that's not, the nose names aren't all that important to you. But they are shorter than skeletal muscle fibers, and they're kind of branched. There's only one nucleus, and they're combined together by intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs allow the electrical signals from one cell to go into the next. And it also connects physically one cell to the next. Why do you think this is more important? That the cells be able to communicate with each other in your heart than in your skeletal muscle. So that your heart goes on. Well, I mean, the, my skeletal muscles work, right? They work just as they planned. Why do these mu cells need more communication than my skeletal muscle? Unless that's involuntary, so we can't tell that they're doing either, so the cells have to communicate during the cell. Yes. And so because, let's take that a little bit further, let's see, because my brain's not telling my heart to do that, what's making them do it? If they can't communicate with each other, they're all still going to contract involuntarily. They're all just going to keep going. But what happens if they can't communicate to each other? They don't do it at the same time, exactly. And so imagine your heart's not going to work very well if one corner contracts and then the other one contracts and while the third one's contracting, and the first one uncontracts. It's not going to pump anything. They all need to go at once. And so there are cells in your heart, this is not part of this, but they're called pacemaker cells. They create the initial impulse, the electrical impulse, and it goes through all of the cells very quickly and so they all contract at the same time. If that didn't, your heart wouldn't be able to pump your blood. These kind of have the, the little stripes in them. It's not nearly as noticeable, though. If it wasn't labeled and not have an arrow right on them, you probably wouldn't even be able to pick them out. If you're really, really looking for them, you, you might be able to see them. But it's not nearly as noticeable as in the skeletal muscle. This is not voluntary. It's in voluntary. Luckily, I can't tell my heart, heart, stop beating, right? I can't say, heart, speed up, right? It's completely involuntary. My brain is controlling how fast my heart beats, right? If I get stressed or I'm exercising, it will speed up. My brain will tell my heart to speed up, but I can't consciously control, 
right? It's unconsciously controlled. Smooth muscle tissue is, uh, to, to me, the most prototypical example of smooth muscle tissue 